Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Key Transitions Supporting the Behavioral Health of Women Veterans, sponsored by SAMHSA Service Members, Veterans, and Their Families Technical Assistance Center. My name is Michael Hawkins. I'm a project manager for the National Council for Behavioral Health, and I will serve as your moderator this afternoon. Before I begin, I'd like to draw your attention to some important webinar logistics. During today's presentation, your slides will automatically synchronize with the, with the audio, so you will not need to flip any slides to follow along. You will listen to the audio through your computer speakers, so please ensure they are on and the volume is up. You may send us questions at any time during the webinar by typing your question into the Ask a Question box in the lower left portion of your player. Depending on the question, we may type an answer back to you or save it for the end. We'll answer as many of your questions as time allows. This webinar is being recorded, and an audio version of the entire webinar, as well as a PDF of the presentation slides, will be available on the webinar archives page on the National Council website within 48 hours of the broadcast. Following the webinar, we invite you to please complete a short survey. Finally, if you need technical assistance, please click on the question mark button in the upper right corner of your player to see a list of frequently asked questions and contact info for tech support if needed. And now, if you're ready, Cicely, I'll pass it to you. Thank you so much, Michael, and welcome all again. Uh, we're really excited to have so many folks across the country joining us for this really important webinar. Uh, my name is Cicely McWay, and I serve uh, as the Military and Veteran Affairs Liaison here at SAMHSA, and I'm so excited to be able to provide just a welcoming introduction to our work uh, here at the agency, as well as uh, to introduce some of the wonderful speakers you'll be hearing from today. I'll keep my remarks brief uh, because we do have a lot of content to share today about the continuum of services and issues facing our women veterans. But I want to start off by welcoming folks and, and sharing my sincere thanks from our administration down uh, for you taking time out of your busy days to focus on this important issue. Next slide, please. Again, disclaimer, just sharing that uh, the views and opinions you'll hear today are those of the speakers. And our next slide. So for the last uh, just over a decade now, SAMHSA has been partnering with both our states and territories and even communities at the city and county level to strengthen the behavioral health systems that serve our service members, our veterans, and their families. We're doing this through our Technical Assistance Center, who's putting on the webinar today, and our focus has been to really make sure that behavioral health, both mental health and substance use issues are addressed in your communities where you receive care, where you're thriving with your families, and where we know that sometimes not all communities have access to exactly the same thing. Our goals are to try to make sure that this is understood and that the resources that are in those communities are strengthened. Next slide. So the uh, goals that we have in doing this work continue to focus around making sure that communities know how to collaborate among their military and civilian stakeholders. We really work hard to make sure that we try to provide a centralized mechanism to coordinate and connect those partners together. And so we hope if you're listening today that you have any issues around commu communicating or connecting with your community partners that you'll hear are playing an integral role for women veterans that you will reach out to us after this webinar. Uh, we also want to increase the awareness and access to resources and programming around behavioral health services for our SMVF population and then make sure that those responses are coordinated in a way that delivers the highest quality care possible. We're encouraging, uh, and we are encouraged, by the work being done in your communities all across the nation to really make sure that we're integrating and prioritizing the behavioral needs of this population. And it couldn't be done without all of the efforts of folks like yourselves on the line. Next slide. The technical assistance methods are similar to those uh, that many of you are probably familiar with, but also have some unique components as well. So of course we have webinars like the one you're listening to today, but also academies and uh, implementation work that gets done face to face. To date, 49 communities across the country have participated in one of those academies. One moment, please. Sorry, I had a tickle in my throat. Uh, the resources are online and virtual, and we hope that folks know that should you have a unique resource in your own community, we work very hard to provide those um, on an as-needed basis, or we try to adapt and bring you resources um, based on the needs that we're hearing from communities. So please, if you could today, give us feedback on what you look for. Uh, look forward to having in your technical assistance resources coming up. Next slide. 
just perfect timing because I think this voice is about to go out, but I'm honored to introduce to everyone Angela Wright, our Assistant Director at the SMZFTA Center. Angela happens to be an Air Force veteran herself, a strong advocate for our military families and caregivers, and does an amazing job bringing her expertise um, in the field of law, in the field of community coordination and uh, resources around increasing military culture and awareness to our communities through all of the technical assistance that the TA, TA Center offers. So again, sorry for the froggy throat, but I'm so honored to have everyone join us today for this important webinar, and I'm going to hand this over to Angela. Thank you so much, Cicely. I, I appreciate that kind introduction. Now get yourself a glass of water. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to uh, host this webinar with SAMHSA today. It's a really important issue. Uh, that is close to my heart as a, as a military veteran and, and uh, family member. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, defining the unique risk factors for women veterans, behavioral health issues. We're going to look at our programming and services for women veterans and describing how we can help bolster the workforce's uh, capacity to provide women veterans with the care that's, that's sensitive to military culture needs, that's trauma-informed, and that's also sensitive to, to unique gender needs at every stage of their life. What's really exciting about our presenters today is that they're going to be taking a look at, uh, at each stage from the transition out of service and into civilian life, from issues around parenting and childcare, all the way through aging issues as we, as we grow older and the unique needs that might pop up then. We want to illustrate opportunities for increased collaboration and coordination, and we also, and most importantly, want to help you discover simple and effective strategies to improve your programs and services for women veterans. Next slide, please. So why is this webinar important? It's important because there are unique challenges that women face as they transition, both from military service to civilian life and through each stage of life. So our presenters are going to take a look at that, and we want you as the listener and audience to uh, take that information and help provide community support that is sensitive to military culture, trauma, and gender. So what I'd like to do now is introduce our presenters today. Next slide, please. Our presenters are uh, Megan Mobes. She is a PhD candidate in clinical psychology at Teachers College at Columbia University. And I'm really excited to have her because she is a graduate from the United States Military Academy at West Point with uh, a degree in comparative politics. She's also commissioned as a quartermaster officer and reports to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where she served as an aerial delivery officer and became a pl platoon leader. After successful completion of her jump master school and the joint airdrop inspector course, she was selected to command an aerial delivery detachment and led the unit in Afghanistan. Ms. Mobs graduated with her MA in Forensic Psychology from George Washington University. She is a Tillman Military Scholar, a two-time Noble Argus Scholarship recipient, and a National Military Family Association Scholarship recipient. We also have with us today Laura Miller, Dr. Laura Miller. She's the Medical Director of Women's Mental Health at Edward Hines Junior VA Hospital. She is a special projects co-lead for the National VA Women's Mental Health Section. She is also a professor of psychiatry at Loyola Stritch School of Medicine. She graduated from Harvard Medical School and completed her psychiatry residency at the University of Chicago. She has developed nationally award-winning women's mental health services and educational programs and she has participated in numerous statewide and national women's mental health policy initiatives. She has authored more than 75 articles and book chapters related to women's mental health, and she devotes her career to improving the mental health of women through clinical care, education, and research. Thank you both to Ms. Mobs and Dr. Miller for joining us for this webinar, and I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Megan Mobs. 
Thank you for that kind introduction. It's always a pleasure to be a part of any opportunity which encourages the sharing of knowledge. And for me, it's a distinct privilege to be in such prestigious company as that of Dr. Miller. So I appreciate you all being here. Next slide, please. So I will be presenting for 20 minutes um, and we have some lofty goals ahead of us, but I think together we can do great things. So I'm going to go through a brief introduction to women veteran demographic and socioeconomic characteristics, what it means to be a woman veteran. We're going to briefly look at veteran identity, look at the critical period from service to citizen and what that looks like related to transition stress, the critical issues at hand, obstacles and barriers to addressing these issues, and then increasing opportunities for, his, for success for all of us to reach this population. Next slide, please. So women are currently 9.4% of the total veteran population, and it's expected to increase at a rate of 18,000 women per year for the next 10 years. So the hope, especially with things like this webinar and other opportunities, is that we are being proactive instead of reactive as this population grows, considering it is the fastest growing population of service members and veterans. The median age of women veterans is 50 compared to 64 for men. So it's broadly a younger population, but again, as you'll see with Dr. Miller's presentation, this growing population of women eventually will age at some point. So trying to understand the trends and follow them over time. 19% of women veterans are African-American compared with 12% of non-veteran women. So that's a greater percentage of the average American population of African-American women. And African-American women are also overrepresented compared to African-American men in the military. Next slide, please. However, Hispanic women veterans are almost half that of non-veterans. However, it's kind of expected as the general percentage of Hispanics increase in our population at large, the expectation is the representative in the military will rise as well. That being said, Asian women veterans are also less than half of that of non-veterans. So there is a, a decrease in that population within the military population and veteran population at large. 84% of women veterans are currently married, divorced, widowed, or separated compared with their non-veteran counterparts in the general population. So broadly speaking, more married, divorced, widowed, separated. Um, and again, of that population, more women are currently divorced compared to that of the non-veteran women, uh, and broadly speaking, in America. However, next slide, please. A higher percentage of women veterans are more racially and ethnically diverse than men veterans, broadly speaking. So as you can see, and I'm going to just kind of quickly run through these charts right here. There's a couple charts over the next few slides, just so you can kind of get an understanding of the comparison of women veterans to male veterans, just to see where we stand, broadly speaking, across a lot of these metrics. So a higher percentage of women veterans are more racially and ethnically diverse than men veterans. And as I said previously, they, for, as African-American women, are more diverse than the general population. That is less true for Hispanics and Asian Americans. Next slide, please. Women veterans are also younger than male veterans at, at large. So some of it's likely due to previous regulations and laws governing military service, but as women veterans increase in the population and with service opportunities, the expectation is, is they will, that population will then age as well, but with the increasing population of women veterans, eventually they will reach homeostasis. Um, next slide, please. However, going, going back to that statistics regarding marriage, a lower percentage of women veterans are married compared to, ma to, to male veterans. A higher percentage of women veterans are widowed or never married compared to male veterans. So kind of thinking back to the earlier slide regarding the general women's population, even more so here as well, I think it's important to note that more women veterans are married compared to male veterans when considering this population. Next slide, please. Now moving to brief some brief socioeconomic characteristics. Women by and large are more educated than their counterparts, both in the non-veteran space compared to women and compared to the males, which I'll get to here in a few slides. So a higher percentage of women veterans and non-veterans have completed a bachelor's or advanced degree. Next slide, please. And broadly speaking, working age women veterans have a higher labor force participation rate than non-veteran women. So women veterans are engaged, they're educated, and they're in the working force at higher rates than their non-veteran counterparts. And overall, women veterans are less likely than non-veteran women to be living in poverty. So that's 10% compared to the 15% that are currently living below the poverty threshold in America. Next slide, please. So the good news kind of compared to the American population at large for women, where women veterans are looking better, 
compared to, ma to male veterans in this population, at least regarding median household incomes, we are doing, women veterans are doing worse. Uh, so women ages 35 and older have a lower median household income than male veterans. Next slide, please. Which is interesting because broadly speaking, women veterans have a higher education attainment and are enrolled in more higher education compared to male veterans. So we are looking better compared to non-veteran women but struggling slightly in comparison to male veterans. Next slide, please. Now, again, a higher percent of women veterans, again, kind of I want to speak contextually to women veterans versus male veterans. So women veterans are generally doing better than non-women veterans related to the poverty threshold, but comparatively speaking to male veterans, they are doing worse. And a higher percentage of women veterans have a service-connected dis disability, have no income, and are in poverty at greater levels than male veterans themselves. And a lower percent of women veterans currently use VA health care, but a higher percentage only use VA health care related to male veterans. Next slide. So all of that just to say that we're setting the stage for trying to understand the kind of the socioeconomic and demographic characteristics of what it means to be a woman veteran. And all of that to say it's extraordinarily complicated and difficult to capture something like this, looking at women both comp compared to other women in America, but also looking at women veterans compared to male veterans. There seems to be this dichotomy of not wanting to be seen as different and wanting to be seen for what they uniquely bring to the table. So broadly speaking, they dislike gender, specific, gender specificity, but they understand the ne necessity of being highlighted as an individual group. So it's kind of this idea of they want to be seen as special, but not a special interest group. And trying to reach that population and bridge that gap between the two, while not making them feel too different, is a really tall order for all of us as we try to reach out to them, whether it's through outreach for uh, health services, whether it's just kind of communication in general, is trying to find that happy medium between seeing them as unique and understanding more often than not, than not, they just want to be seen as veterans. And when I'm speaking about gender specificity here, I'm kind of speaking about, you know, what we, we see when we think of veterans, like the bumper stickers, the t-shirts, or even sometimes titling of presentations or seminars themselves. If they're gender targeted or gender specific, more often than not, women will not join in because they do not want to be seen as a unique subset uh, and, highlight, and those inherent differences highlighted in that capacity. So when is a veteran just a veteran? Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Um, so kind of a quick personal story. Uh, I don't know if anybody has Harris Teeter where they live. It's a, it's a grocery store. And out front, they have parking spots that are the, uh, next to the handicapped parking spots. There are usually a number of reserved spots for veteran parking. More often than not, I choose not to use these spots, which is, I think, interesting in and of itself. And I constantly kind of think of this idea of taking up space. And I think this is something that women service members and women veterans struggle with as well. It's how much space am I allowed to take up? And, uh, but it was one day, it was, it was hot. It was in the middle of the summer, I was pregnant and I really just needed to get in and out of the grocery store. So I decided for the first time to park in this spot. So I pull in, I park. I get out and I'm kind of not really thinking anything of it outside of this. this is the first time I'm parking there and someone drives by, rolls down the window and, and says to me, well, you know, those are for veterans, don't you? And that was the first time that I really felt like I had to justify my existence in, a, in, a, in, a, as, in the world as a woman veteran. And I think that that experience of feeling that I have to justify myself, whether at it's at a parking lot, whether it's in the VA waiting room, whether it's at a nonprofit gathering, I think is something that's shared by a large portion of the veteran population. Next slide, please. And why does this matter? Kind of taking a look at the culture milieu of what's kind of happening from pop culture to veteran service organizations in this space, it's really important to note that the predominant focus has been on the contributions and the very valid and necessary contributions that male service members have made to the global war on terror. So I, I kind of did a quick like Google search of the top movies, the top books that have emerged from the recent campaigns from the global war on terror, so the campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan, and this is kind of what returned. These are the top movies, the, pop, the top popular books, and they're all through the experience and through the lens of the male service member and their contributions to the recent campaigns. And I think it's important to note, one, this is not to take away or to detract from their contributions, 
And there's nothing that is highlighting the current and ongoing contributions of women military members and veterans across this space. Um, and the VSO, I wanted to highlight, if you look at those, and I know it's very small, but all the different logos. Now, the majority of them are obviously are gender neutral, but those are the majority of the, the kind of leading VSOs right now in this space. There's the big six. There's also some emerging post 9-11 veteran VSOs. And none of them are directly targeting women veterans. And those that do have any sort of image related to uh, military service or either kind of an icon of a person, they all seem to be interpreted as men. Um, so even if we're, if we're not necessarily specifically targeting the, the, the female veteran population, these are kind of the implicit signs that we're not welcome or maybe our perspective isn't quite ready to be heard yet. Next slide, please. So kind of speaking again about the unique needs of women veterans, I really wanted to include this picture because I think sometimes we fail to consider even at the very basic level that military service is still predominantly targeted towards men. And even things like body armor are designed and fit specifically for men. And women are left to kind of figure out how they can accommodate themselves within that, within that paradigm. So I'm wearing male body armor, but I still need it to protect me. I think it's a really good allegory for how we're trying to understand how to reach this population and then treat them effectively. So as I said before, we're not the same, but we would like to be equally considered. And that's kind of some qualitative data, what women veterans are kind of expressing generally. We understand we're not the same, but we would like our unique experiences to be equally considered. We are exposed to similar hazards. And as I was saying before, as the population of women veterans increase in military service, they're also going to be exposed to more of these hazards as well to include combat as now all uh, branches, <coughs> excuse me, I'm having coughing too. Uh, all these military occup occupational specialties and all these branches are open to women as well. So the expectation and kind of in preparedness and again being proactive versus reactive is the expectation that women veterans are going to be exposed to more levels of combat and here in the future. They're also exposed to military sexual trauma at different rates than men. And there is just simply the uniqueness of being a woman within the military context. I referenced body armor, but outside of that, there's a, a broad number of things that kind of goes into being a woman in a military structure that I think sometimes is not necessarily fully thought through or um, explored when understanding military women and women veterans in general. Next slide, please. And some of that plays into a woman's identity. So how do we identify ourselves as a veteran? So there's this fantastic paper that was done, um, the, the citation is below, looking at women's veteran identity and the utilization of health services. And this has really identified a gap in the literature regarding how we can better understand women veterans in the context of their identity and their help seeking behavior. And that's important because we cultivate identity in a very, very, very powerful way as service members transition into the military service. And this is you know, gender nonspecific, but we invest a significant amount of time and energy in transforming civilians to service members, and we do very little to help them transition from service member to citizen. So understanding how that veteran identity plays in or plays out into help-seeking behavior is particularly important, especially as it pertains to women veteran identities. So from this study, this was a qualitative study that was done, it was found that the younger generation of veterans, so uh, female veterans from Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom, feel very strong, positive connections to their veteran identity, broadly speaking. And the centrality of their identity, so th them holding it kind of center as their self-concept, was related to their choice to use uh, veteran health administration, medical and mental health care facilities, and it suggested that this is a kind of broad metric to see whether or not they seek out care in general. So understanding how that veteran identity can play a role in a, a service member, or I'm sorry, in a veteran seeking care is very, very important. And the idea that holding this identity in positive regard, so viewing it through the lens of positivity, believing that it's con contributed to their life and to their well-being, is also associated with future intentions to use uh, to use care as well. So truly trying to understand how we can capture those who identify positively or hold that veteran identity centrally, and what that means for for care and for use of services for all of us. Next slide, please. And it's even more important as we begin to understand how that might play out during the transition period. 
So again, as I was saying earlier about how we cultivate this identity transitioning in, we often fail to transition this identity as, as service members leave. So during that time frame, as, as everyone's really struggling to reconcile their previous self with their current self, uh, kind of a period of transition stress can emerge. So recent population survey studies suggest that a very high level percentage of veterans experience stress during the transition to civilian life. Now, PTSD is a post-traumatic stress disorder. Prevalence rates for the, this current population, so the younger generation of veterans, just speaking about post-9-11 veterans right now, studies estimate anywhere from about 7.7 to 20 percent prevalence rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, those upper limits are, are high, uh, depending on the methodology used. However, transition stress seems to be something that's relatively ubiquitous across uh, combat exposure, across rank, across gender. Uh, and it's related to identity. So how do we help these, these service members, women veterans, kind of understand that that identity is very important, that they can have positive regard for it, and it can be central, and it may play a role in, in, in their transition off of active service and into the veteran space, uh, in particular because it impacts employment, interpersonal difficulties, it can increase conflicted relations, um, and it also can uh, speak to adapting to kind of the schedule of civilian life, but not even just the schedule, just kind of the, the cultural context of immersing themselves in that. Next slide, please. And the problem is that this struggle for this generation of veterans is reported at higher, more difficult levels than any other previous generation of veterans. And transition stress has been found to predict treatment seeking and a later development of mental health physical health problems, and suicidal, suicidal ideation. And we know that the majority of first suicide attempts typically occur after military separation. So it's a critical time across both genders, but in particular, as we begin to understand women veteran identity, this part becomes even more salient. Next slide, please. Especially as we consider the critical issues that surround women veterans and what their primary service connected conditions are. Now, the, the, in the red box, you can see those are the top four things that account for 29.9% of all service connected disabilities for women veterans in 2015. That's post traumatic stress disorder, major depressive disorder, migraines, and lower back pain. Next slide, please. Some of which is contributed or attributed to military sexual trauma. So military sexual trauma is reported at much higher rates for women than in men. So kind of roughly speaking, one in four women experience it during their period of service versus one in 100 men. So 13.9% report military sexual trauma when the measure assesses simply assault. Um, but that increases to a much higher level when the, the measure assesses harassment. And regardless of the type of victimization, women evidence a much larger prevalence rate compared to men, which is obviously going to contribute to their experience within the military, but even going kind of back further to what we were just speaking about, about their identity, kind of positive regard may be impacted or affected when their experience in the military uh, was, was negative, in particular when it's perpetuated by another service member. Next slide, please. And another critical issue that gets often overlooked that's highly prevalent or highly related to gender within the military are body dysmorphic disorders. There's not a lot of bodies, there's not a lot of evidence or a body of research, to use body again, to, to talk about what the prevalence rates are currently. However, it is suggested, there are the few studies that do exist, suggest that there are high prevalence rates. So kind of even in men themselves, but also in females. And if we really think about the context of the military, this makes sense. We're kind of constantly measuring what do you look like in uniform? How much do you weigh? How fast can you run? And there's this hyper focus on bodies and, and what we know about women and self-esteem and our own bodies. Um, this can be, it can uh, be very insidious for those that are serving, and that can fall in as they transition off of active duty. Uh, so that there are prevalence rates you can see here on the slide, uh, but much higher for women veterans versus men, which can contribute later to the development of, of other related uh, psychological distress. Next slide, please. And even though all of these, these kind of critical issues exist, military sexual trauma, uh, I didn't speak on combat exposure, but combat exposure, body dysmorphic disorders, there are a significant number of obstacles and barriers to treatment. What we know about women veterans uh, is that they are likely to have children and they're likely to be kind of, even if they are not a single parent, they're likely to be the person who exhibits parenthood within the relationship, meaning they're the one that's kind of taking the children. And this is by and large speaking, 
uh, taking their children to appointments or practice or being the kind of primary parent within, within the household. What me, and what that means for those that are trying to provide services to veterans is that often they are unable to attend either events, services, treatment because of the necessity of childcare um, related to just their role in the family. Moreover, there is very often a lack of gender-specific care programs, and I know earlier I was speaking how we want to be seen, you know, women veterans want to be seen as special but not special interest. Uh, there are at times, obviously, that very gender-specific care programs are a necessity for women veterans, and they are frequently not offered. Um, there's at times a lack of option for women, for women to choose other women doctors, especially related to gynecological care. They don't feel part of the community. I just took a clip it of a few very recent articles related to uh, women veterans and, and seeking out services. So women are the most visible service members and the most invisible veterans. The VA struggles to curb harassment of female veterans in medical centers, the inconvenience of being a woman veteran, and with more women in the armed services, some female vets don't feel like that. Um, so all this to say that there, this is a kind of broad reaching phenomenon that's occurring where women veterans don't feel part of the community and capable of really buying into what's happening within the veteran space as the veteran nonprofit space booms, as there's more access to care. Uh, women veterans aren't necessarily buying at the same rate male veterans are. And some of that can be attributed to alienation from institutions as it pertains to their military service. Next slide, please. So, how can we increase our opportunities for success? It is possible we can all be successful in reaching uh, our women veterans who need care. Uh, kind of a three-pronged approach, like how do we best identify them? How do we conduct meaningful, not like kind of, you know, uh, what is the word I want to use? Like stereotypical outreach, kind of really meaningful, thoughtful outreach, and then establish real connectivity with our, with our women veterans. So there's a variety of ways that we can do that. Um, so I have them kind of listed here, but I also have them uh, by the numbers in the next slide. Uh, so if you can the next slide, please. So kind of the first one is engage women veterans for peer support activities to support treatment and recovery. And some of that is by hosting recognition events because a lot of women veterans don't believe that they qualify for service. This is kind of typically relates to a little bit older generation of veterans who either didn't deploy and don't feel that they qualify for services at the VA, all the way down to those that have deployed but feel that they don't qualify for services because they didn't see combat. So peer-to-peer -peer outreach can be can be huge in bridging that gap and providing information to those women veterans who don't feel that they qualify for services. And it's even more meaningful when it comes from a peer-to-peer -peer versus some hierarchical or structured uh, type of outreach event. Including screening and assessment questions that address military experience and also recognize a woman's military contributions and their unique experience. So really being very sensitive to understanding what a woman veteran experiences and how you can tailor questions on your intake, during your screening, or even on assessments that capture uh, and understand the woman veteran's experience. So from the word go when they pick up that pen that they know that they are being seen as a unique individual. Ensure that organization is trauma-informed and welcoming to women veterans. And if it's not, being able to offer or provide referrals to those trauma-specific trauma or trauma-informed interventions and services. So really making sure and understanding that women veterans are more likely to be exposed to military sexual trauma, and as a result, more likely to potentially manifest something like post-traumatic stress disorder or major depressive disorder related to that experience and ensuring that they have the appropriate care to treat that trauma-related uh, distress. Ensure all touch points are aware and understand the unique culture and experiences of women veterans. Um, so making sure that if a woman approaches the counter, they aren't seen as a spouse or as a civilian, but they're seen as the veteran themselves. So making sure that all touch points from your receptionist to your outreach coordinator to the provider within the organization is well aware of the contributions of women veterans that, you know, are, are, are long, we're not talking kind of recent veterans, Women have been involved in the military for, for a very, very long period of time. So making sure that they understand the individual contributions of women veterans. Next slide, please. And then last but not least, ensuring kind of what I was thinking earlier about parenthood, making sure that there is safe child kid care treatment during programming so that they're capable of, of utilizing that and being able to engage in the services that are provided, knowing that their children are safe and taken care of. So whether it's hosting a conference or whether it's treatment in general, 
being able to, if possible, provide child care services for those women veterans, uh, provide treatment and recovery services that address individual and family needs. So again, being very un informed and understanding of how you can reach out and really touch all of the different areas of a woman veteran's life, from her child, from the relationship she has with her spouse, uh, to kind of looking at the holistic approach um, to the family. Developing integrated care coordination models is a good advice regardless of whatever population that you're reaching out to, um, but really making sure that across the board, the woman veteran is getting seen for all the different issues that she might manifest. Uh, going back to the host recognition events, so really making sure that women veterans understand, um, kind of conducting a, a psychological operation campaign to make sure women veterans know how they can be reached and that they are valued and what qualifies them for services. Even for male veterans, many often don't seek out care because they do not think they qualify for a variety of re reasons or they feel it's highly stigmatized or they feel that they don't qualify for the offered treatment or their treatment preferences in conflict with the offered treatment. The same holds true for women veterans. So making sure that they understand that they do qualify for services, what those services look like can be a very powerful thing. Leveraging social media at all levels, women are more likely than men across gender strata to use social media. And I put to include Instagram here, I think we often forget, even though it's a picture sharing site, there is a lot of information being shared on a platform like Instagram. And for the younger generation of veterans, about 18 to 35, they're more likely than not to have an Instagram account. So being able to reach out across all social media levels and utilizing it to really engage and provide some of that uh, kind of psychoeducation I was speaking a moment, uh, a moment ago about. And then thinking and engaging holistically. It's obviously good advice for anything, but by the numbers, really looking at women veterans across all the different contexts they might exist in and how you can reach them across those different things. It's very important and also understanding, and I think Dr. Miller is going to speak about this as well, but not just kind of targeting the mind, but targeting the body as well um, it, with fitness related events um, and encouraging them to use those opportunities for things like yoga or hiking um, or other opportunities to begin approaching some of these issues from a holistic perspective. Um, next slide. As this is the conclusion of my presentation, I know that that was very speedy. I apologize. I wanted to make sure I got through a lot of the information. I know the slides will be uh, will be presented to everybody at the end. Some of the demographic information up front kind of, again, was just a once over the moon to make sure that we understood a little bit about the context in which we're facing. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak to you all today. I thank you very much for your time. Uh, and it was a great pleasure that I pass this off to Dr. Laura Miller. Hello, everybody, um, and thank you so much, Megan, for that amazing presentation, and thanks to all of you for taking this time to um, think together with us about women veterans and how we can support them. Um, I'm going to be talking about women veterans and aging, uh, so if you could go to the next slide. Uh, I have no uh, conflict of interest to declare, and I don't plan to discuss any off-label medications. Uh, what I do plan to discuss is on the next slide, um, which is key health and mental health challenges that are faced by older women veterans, uh, and specifically because, as you heard, the prevalence of trauma is so high among veterans, the influence of trauma on the aging process lifestyle factors which can improve health and mental health as women age regardless of diagnosis, and why that self-identification as a veteran that Megan discuss, discussed matters particularly for older women. Uh, and then I'll be talking a little bit about VA resources for women. So if we could go on to the next slide. Um, this elaborates on what you heard from Megan about the age distribution of veterans, that as you can see among the older age groups, there is a higher proportion of male than female veterans. Uh, this is largely because before conscription ended in the early 1970s, um, the numbers and percentages of women who could serve in the military was quite limited uh, by statute. And uh, it, it was only in the early 90s with the first Persian Gulf War that the number of women veterans and the percent of women veterans increased, or women serving in the military increased dramatically, creating more um, women who became veterans. Um, as you can see, there's a very large peak of women who are in midlife now poised to enter the older age group. So it's a very timely uh, discussion that we're having now, how do we prepare? 
uh, how do we proactively prepare ourselves and any agencies that we work for as women veteran age. So if we look at the next slide, we can see the numbers in a little more detail. Uh, as of 2015, 12% 12 of women veterans were um, 65 years old or older. And from 2000 to 2015, in those 15 years, that midlife subgroup grew more than sevenfold. So we can see how many um, women veterans will be um, aging over 65 within the coming decade. And if you go to the next slide, we can see the implications for mental health. In those same years, the number of women veterans receiving VA mental health care increased nearly fivefold, while for men the increase was twofold. And uh, among women veterans that are age 65 or older, the proportion with mental health conditions increased substantially from 19% to 31%. If we could go on to the next slide, um, we'll see a, a, a little bit about sex and gender influences on health and aging. In some respects, uh, being female is protective as we age in that on average for a variety of biological and cultural reasons, women live longer than men. That, however, poses a challenge in that older women therefore spend more years with disabilities, unpartnered, and financially strained. Uh, regarding mental health implications, again, there are certain things that are protective about female gender. That um, as we age, it's common to develop functional limitations and that contributes more to depression in men than it does in women as we age. Um, retiring from paid work, likewise, is associated with more psychological distress for men than it is for women. And there's one compelling reason for that, in that psychological health after we retire or develop functional limitations is aided by being quite involved in social, community, religious, leisure, and caring activities. And on average, women engage in more of these than men, which is partly protective. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> we see that there are also influences on having served in the military as women um, age. And in this respect, when we compare women veterans to women civilians, we see that women veterans are more likely to die before age 80 and unfortunately have more impaired physical functioning, less social support, lower satisfaction with life, quality of life, and less of a sense of purpose in life. Um, so it's important to tease out some of the influences, especially modifiable influences. One key modifiable influence uh, is that women veterans tend more than women civilians to smoke and consume alcohol. So this is a key focus of health um, in aging for women veterans. However, that is not the, the primary influence. The primary influence will be shown on the next slide, and that is uh, trauma. One in five women that are enrolled at VA screen positive for military sexual trauma, and that is just one of a number of traumas that women experience, more so uh, when they're veterans and when they're civilians, and more so when they're women than in men. So looking at the next slide, we'll see that traumas in general are experienced much more by women veterans than by civilian women. And compared to the civilian women and to male veterans, women veterans experience especially more sexual trauma, not just military sexual trauma, but also childhood sexual trauma and other sexual trauma. And among all types of trauma, sexual trauma is the most likely type of trauma to result in post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, called conditional risk. PTSD accelerates aging in a variety of ways. And we don't have time to go into all of those ways, but the next slide shows you one example of a specific biological way in which PTSD accelerates aging. What we're looking at on this slide is a drawing of a chromosome. And on the end of the chromosome, you see these things that look like caps. They're actually molecules um, called telomeres that protect the chromosome. And as that cell with that chromosome in it divides, each time it divides, the telomere shortens. 
until eventually, at some point, um, the telomere is gone altogether. And at that point, that cell dies. So telomere length is strongly correlated with longevity. And that is influenced by genetics, which is why there are some long-lived families, and by sex. Women have longer telomeres on average than men, which is part of why women live longer. However, PTSD shortens telomeres. And there's more shortening the more severe the PTSD symptoms are. So if we could go to the next slide, we'll see other reasons that PTSD affects health as women veterans age. Um, PTSD is associated with elevated risk of a variety of illnesses, cardiovascular ones like high blood pressure and heart disease, GI illnesses like gastritis and stomach ulcer, also arthritis, which can cause a lot of physical impairment and chronic pain and therefore depression, and as well, dementia is increased uh, in the context of PTSD as we age. So if I could go into the next slide, we'll see that also, besides PTSD affecting aging and health, aging also ex affects the expression of PTSD symptoms, especially by reducing the availability of methods that women may have previously used to cope with their trauma. One really helpful coping tr strategy is keeping busy. Um, and with retirement from paid work or an empty nest or both, um, it may be more of a challenge to keep busy enough. Another really helpful thing is staying physically active. Uh, and with chronic pain and mobility limitations that might develop, it's harder to do that. Engaging with friends and relatives can become more difficult if there are losses, if some of those friends and relatives have died, and with inability to drive, that might limit social interchange as well. A lot of people who have experienced trauma have an ongoing tendency to scan the environment to feel safe. With reduced visual and or auditory acuity, um, that's harder to do and anxiety may mount. Hearing deficits in particular are more common in military personnel who have ever been deployed. Another really important strategy for managing anxiety from PTSD is reframing an anxious thought. So say, for example, a woman enters an elevator and there's a man in the elevator. Her immediate thought, if she has been sexually abused, might be, he could rape me. Reframing means she looks and she says, well, his body language does not look threatening. He looks like he's on his way to an appointment, just like I am. Um, he looks pretty friendly. Chances that he will rate me are low. So that's reframing, kind of reality testing. With reduced cognitive abilities, it's more difficult to do that, and anxiety from PTSD can increase as we age if that happens. So if we could go on to uh, the next slide. Uh, that being said, with all this talk about trauma and its adverse effects on health, it's important to note that a number of veterans, including women veterans, uh, are quite resilient with low levels of psychological distress despite having experienced high levels of trauma. And we know something about that resilience. Some of it is biological. Um, but some of it has to do with things that we can modify, being socially connected, being really integrated into broader social networks like churches and communities, having a sense of purpose in life, and having positive perceptions of the effects of military service on one's life, as Megan uh, talked about previously. So if we could go on to the next slide, um, we'll look at some factors um, that are particularly influential in maintaining health for older women veterans. And we can go on to the next slide for uh, the first of these, uh, which is exercise. Um, there's strong research evidence that resistance exercise, which is strength training, and endurance exercise, which is aerobic type exercise, um, is quite beneficial for health in older women. It improves physical functioning, reduces the loss of muscle that otherwise occurs with age, reduces bone loss and therefore fracture risk. It reduces the risk of um, heart disease, diabetes, and falls by, by helping balance improve. It improves mood, reduces depression, improves quality of life, and reduces cognitive decline as well. So 
that's all wonderful and very soundly researched. What actually happens, unfortunately, in the real world is that we have this recommendation, uh, very widely publicized, at least 150 minutes per week, uh, which is uh, approximately 30 minutes five days a week, of moderate to vigorous exercise, um, and that's what's recommended to maintain health, to have all these benefits. Unfortunately, less than 5% of older adults are able to meet that recommendation. So we as a society have to do better than that. We, something's not right if, you know, in, in terms of public policy if less than 5% of people are meeting that recommendation. Um, so there's been a turn in research and in public policy thinking to looking at the opposite extreme, which is what does it do to health to be completely sedentary? Sedentary meaning lying down or sitting while awake. And older adults spend about 85% of their waking time completely sedentary. Uh, that can increase even more if there are things like hospitalizations or bad weather and there's even further muscle disuse, and that really accelerates the health, health risks of being sedentary. So putting that all together, we can look at the next slide to get some practical tips for older women veterans regarding exercise. For veterans in particular, by definition, um, women uh, who are veterans were once very physically fit and very physically active. And that, to some degree, remains. Compared with um, non-veteran civilian women, older women veterans have higher physical activity levels on average. However, uh, some older women veterans, when they start to want to resume exercise, get in this tremendous despair because they're remembering how they used to be. And they're so different now in their minds than how they used to be when they were perhaps in their 20s that um, that negative comparison with their past selves makes them very despairing and they give up altogether and don't want to exercise because the reminder is too painful. In addition, um, some women like to exercise in a gym environment, but unfortunately a gym environment can trigger a lot of traumatic memories particularly if one's been sexually abused, but even other sorts of um, military-related memories. So a lot of people avoid that environment. So some solutions can be there's a form of brief psychotherapy to grieve the losses, including the loss of, of one's prior body image, um, and adjust expectations to be realistic for the current day and reframe any all-or-nothing thinking and get out and some of the body dysmorphic issues that Megan referred to as well. Um, physiatrists or physical therapists can be really helpful to guide women how to adapt exercise to physical limitations and needs because otherwise some older women might fear, for example, having a heart attack if they exercise or might feel like um, their pain will be worse if they exercise, whereas with proper guidance, pain can really improve with exercise. Um, those who want to work out in the gym but fear it can have uh, gradual exposure therapy to get used to that gym environment again. Um, but there are many other home exercise programs that are available um, regardless of weather problems or driving, and many of these are free of charge. Um, the other thing is for those who just, for whatever reasons, cannot do the moderate to vigorous activity, there is evidence that even just being less sedentary, having low-intensity walking or doing light housework um, also confers health benefits. Not all of the health benefits of more vigorous exercise, but still improves muscle synthesis, bone strength, blood sugar control, and mood, so very worthwhile doing. If we could go on to the next slide, uh, we'll talk about nutrition and aging. So it's pretty common for energy requirements to decrease as we age. So unless we reduce what we're eating, typically weight gain happens, um, and it's extremely common um, starting around menopause for women to gain weight. What a lot of women don't realize is that their protein requirements may actually increase as they age, especially when they're healing from a wound, fighting an infection, repairing a fracture, and especially if they're trying to restore muscle mass that they've lost with age. Um, the, the other key factor, especially in terms of mood, but also in terms of chronic pain, is that some um, 
foods that we eat increase inflammation in our body, and that increases our vulnerability to depression. And other foods reduce inflammation in our body, and that reduces depression. Um, examples of the main culprits that are inflammatory foods are refined sugars um, as well as uh, refined flour and red meat. So eliminating some of those very inflammatory foods from the diet can make a big difference in terms of mood and in terms of pain. The other thing that becomes relatively common with aging are micronutrient deficiencies. And I'd like to highlight two in particular that are strongly implicated in mental health problems. Um, vitamin B12 is harder for the stomach to absorb as we age. That's called bioavailability. That decreases with age. Vitamin D is typically manufactured by the sun hitting our skin, and there's a precursor molecule in our skin that the sunlight transforms into vitamin D. That precursor decreases with age. So even if an elderly person is getting enough sun, um, they still may not be able to manufacture enough vitamin D for their health needs. So if we could go on to the next slide, we can um, talk about some barriers to healthy nutrition, but as well some solutions. Um, that many people as they age develop difficulty chewing and or swallowing. So diagnosing and treating those problems is really crucial to maintain overall health. And when they're not treatable, having a mechanically soft diet that is still nutritious and getting nutritionist help and figuring out how to do that. Um, then there's also, as we talked about, difficulty digesting or absorbing particular nutrients or micronutrients, and supplements might be necessary for that reason. Then there are also dietary restrictions due to various illnesses, and a lot of elderly folks say, well, you know, because of my kidney problems, I have restrictions of certain things, and my GI problems, I'm restricted for other foods, and then my diabetes, there's other restrictions. Nothing's left for me to eat. So in that case, a nutrition consult to really prioritize uh, and figure out what is, is something that the person can safely eat could be really helpful. A lot of people just have reduced access to healthy food. Um, and in that case, figuring out some case management solutions to get access are, is really helpful. There are food pantries available, including at VA. So for example, at our VA, our food pantry is on Thursdays. So when we know somebody is in need, we try to schedule their medical appointments on Thursday so they can just right after their appointment go to the food pantry, pick up food, and bring it home. Um, sometimes online delivery services can be helpful if a person is computer savvy and comfortable with that. Um, and then there's also an, a, a, a factor that's particularly salient for women. Many women, their whole lives have been cooking for other people, like a whole family, for instance. And when it's just them, there's a lot of reduced motivation to cook a nice, healthy meal just for themselves. And it's really important to elicit that and do some motivational interviewing to go through uh, some of the reasons why it might be really helpful to cook a nice, healthy meal for themselves, and even better, to look for meal-sharing opportunities if that is what the woman prefers. So if we could go on to the next slide, uh, we'll talk about another key health factor, which is sleep. Sleep quality in general tends to decline with age, but that is modifiable. There are key factors which are known to improve sleep quality in older women, including positive relationships, having a sense of purpose in life, self-acceptance, exercise again, and weight reduction. In addition, there are a number of diseases that can be diagnosed and treated that interfere with sleep. There are sleep disorders that increase in women as they age, including obstructive sleep apnea and restless leg syndrome. Psychiatric disorders of many types can interfere with normal sleep, and frequent nighttime urination or nocturia um, is treatable and can interfere with sleep if it is not treated. So if we could go on to uh, the next slide, uh, we'll talk about another key health factor, which is sexuality with aging. Um, the gender differences in the frequency of sexual activity and satisfaction and desire do increase with age, meaning that um, men tend in general to desire more sexual activity than women do. Uh, however, 75% of older women report that sex is the same as or better than when they were younger. Um, 
if there is sexual satisfaction, it influences in a positive way self-regard. It reduces the risk of depression and loneliness. Um, interestingly, marriage is a strong predictor of sexual activity and satisfaction in women, but not men. So as women become widowed, that is a significant barrier to sexual satisfaction. Uh, other barriers for older women are more physical, difficulty um, with vaginal dryness and getting enough lubrication and therefore having pain during intercourse. And another source of pain are some pelvic floor disorders that increase over time, like incontinence and prolapse of the uterus, for example. Um, there are multidisciplinary teams at VAs consisting of gynecologists, psychotherapists, and psychiatrists who come together to address sexual dysfunction in women in general, including the specific needs of um, older women veterans. So if we could go on to the next slide, another really key psychological factor to highlight that matters quite a bit in mental health as we age is forgiveness. And forgiveness can be empirically defined as um, <clears throat> if somebody has wronged us, um, we might for a while avoid them. We might wish for revenge. Over time, if we reduce our need to avoid them and if we reduce our preoccupation with revenge, that constitutes, psychologically speaking, forgiveness, whether we overtly believe that we have forgiven them or not. It's not a matter of saying what they did was okay. It's just a matter of being less preoccupied with revenge and avoidance. And that is associated with reduced depression as people age. There are some interesting gender effects that as compared to men, women forgive others more readily but themselves less readily. Self-forgiveness protects mental health in both men and women, so helping women forgive themselves is a really important thing for their health. Uh, this, there's a particular type of self-forgiveness that is difficult to come by for some veterans, and that's called moral injury. Um, those are symptoms that look a lot like PTSD, um, but they're based on doing one's job, the military job that one is there to do, but in a way that ends up violating one's conscience anyway. So for example, if one did something to contribute to people dying or directly kills people in the course of duty, um, some have a tremendous difficulty for years and years later forgiving themselves for having done that, um, even though it was essential to do and even though intellectually they're aware that more people may have died if they had not done what they did. So that's a particularly important issue to address at any point of life, but particularly as people age. So if we could go on to the next slide. Um, um, getting back to um, what Megan talked about, about self-identification as a veteran, does that matter um, for older women? Does that matter for their health? And on the next slide, we'll see um, that it, it very much does matter. That, um, and yet, there are many, many older women who do not self-identify as veterans. Um, until conscription ended, which happened in 1973, women in the military not only had restricted numbers, as I said earlier, but they had restricted roles. Uh, they were almost exclusively nurses and clerks. And although they were definitely active duty military, many did not self-identify that they were actually soldiers. Um, Partly, they, if they did not participate directly in combat, if they were not deployed to a hot zone where active combat was going on, um, if they want to avoid trauma reminders, they might not self-identify as a veteran. And most importantly, to underscore what Megan said, others in society do not view them as veterans. Um, Self-identifying as a veteran, however, improves knowledge of and access to a plethora of really important healthcare opportunities that are otherwise pretty hard to come by, such as geriatric specialty care, home-based medical care for those who cannot come to a clinic, trauma-informed care, and travel benefits for those who do want to come to a clinic but need assistance with that. Then there's also ancillary, very important services like skilled nursing facilities, adult daycare, home helpers, respite care, caregiver support, adaptations in the home. And there are social networks that are, are very rich and helpful to access as people age. 
So if we could go to the next slide, we'll see that besides those practical advantages, there are some sort of invisible advantages to self-identifying as a veteran in that part of one's self-identity can be as a trailblazer, as a role model, as a patriot. So if we go on to um, the next slide, um, we'll see that VA has a number of resources specifically for women. Uh, the clinicians at VA are extensively trained specifically in women's mental health, including intensive in-person training with a life cycle approach, and that is followed by monthly national teleconferences specifically about women's mental health. Every VA in the U.S. has a women's mental health champion, at least one, whose job it is to advance women's mental health programming uh, and services at that VA. There's a specific psychotherapy for women who've experienced interpersonal trauma, like sexual trauma or intimate partner violence. That's called STAIR, which stands for Skills Training for Affective and Interpersonal Regulation. And there's widespread training uh, of clinicians to do this kind of psychotherapy throughout VA. And there are also eating disorders multidisciplinary teams getting at some of the um, body dysmorphic issues that um, Megan talked about earlier that show up in aging women as well. So if we can go on to the next slide, we'll see um, additional resources. Uh, there are national consultation services for um, issues that arise related to military sexual trauma and reproductive mental health, including perimenopause and beyond. Uh, and there's also an end sex-based harassment initiative. Uh, VA is quite aware that a number of women veterans coming to a VA environment might sometimes experience harassment, typically from, um, unfortunately, male veterans who were socialized to do that um, as part of, of a, a military culture that they experienced during active duty. So there's a great deal of social messaging posters about this throughout VAs. There's specific training for staff, police, and veterans how to end harassment and why, including bystander training if you observe this. And there's a program called Sister a Sister, where a trained volunteer who's a woman veteran will um, accompany another woman veteran through the VA to her appointments and back as she wishes. So if we could go on to the next slide, um, we're just summarized by some of the things we all can do and our, we can um, encourage our agencies to foster, which is talking to older women veterans about their mental health, about social connection, about trauma and its effect on their current life and health, and about the available VA resources and identify and addressing barriers in each case to exercise and physical activity, healthy eating, sleep quality, sexuality, and ability to forgive oneself and others. Um, so uh, that is the end of my presentation. There are a few more slides that just have the references for those who would like to read any further um, about the research that backs up um, some of these issues. And thank you so much for your uh, attention and interest. Thank you so much for your um, presentations today. Um, as you can see, we have uh, reached the question and answer part of our webinar. So um, those of you who have not yet submitted a question, please feel free to do so via the um, question uh, functionality of the platform. We'd also like to recognize that uh, a number of you have shared your stories, your um, warm thoughts about our presenters, and recommendations um, regarding uh, meeting materials. Those have all been received on our end. Each of our presenters have seen them. So thank you very much for sharing those with us. Um, uh, let's see if we can get into some of the questions we have here so far. Uh, we have a question here regarding the percentage um, or statistics regarding um, women versus men veterans with regard to homelessness and wondered if there are uh, materials available for, um, for those interested in that topic. And I think at first we'd want to um, direct folks to the VA's National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans. Their 2018 report is available. Um, and wasn't sure if anyone on the line wanted to speak further to that.
Um, great. So the other question we have here that I would like to direct to you, Megan, is um, related to someone's personal story that they, they shared with us, which is that um, related to their title, as they um, were getting closer to sort of transition, they um, had trouble sort of as a service member um, with their own title as a female. Got it close over here. There we go. So that she says that she knew how to address herself as a service member, but once she left, uh, her title as a female um, she felt more related to her marital status and, um, and that it was not addressed at transition 40 years ago. Does this issue uh, address now with service members? You know, unfortunately, thank you for the question. And I've been kind of monitoring the questions um, as this is the presentations have gone on. And I want to apologize up front for those that I was speaking too fast for. The slides will be available, so I hope that you guys can take advantage of the resources that will be available. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't made a lot of effort to really begin addressing title, identity, and what it means when we transition out of service. So unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of developments in that arena. So Soldier for Life or the Transition Assistance Programming is now mandated by the DOD. So the Department of Defense has mandated that there is transition assistance programming that every service member has to receive as they leave active service and move into the citizen sector. However, currently that kind of five day mandated course really only covers employment opportunities, kind of employment skill sets, and also those related to kind of educational attainment. So resume building, how to dress for success, also how to access VA benefits, how to register for VA benefits. But there's very little that touches upon kind of the psychological, emotional, or cognitive impacts of service. So with regard to addressing oneself in terms of title or even how they see themselves as a service member, vice a veteran is not at all addressed. And it's certainly a gap in how we can begin to really kind of improve service member lives if we can begin addressing those things sooner rather than later and beginning to be proactive instead of reactive to some of these issues as they come up. So it's a, it's a point well made and I wish I could say we'd made strides in that direction. Um, we haven't yet. So there's hope there, um, and I think there are lots of people that are working towards including that in the transition assistance programming. Thanks so much, Megan. Uh, this next question I'd like to direct to Dr. Miller. Uh, someone asked if migraines are being explored further for traumatic, traumatic brain injury. Um, they are, um, and indeed there's a strong uh, correlation between uh, migraines and traumatic brain injury. There's also, by the way, a strong correlation between migraines and military sexual trauma, even in the absence of traumatic brain injury. So there are probably um, ways that psychological trauma and physical trauma interact with one another to cause a variety of downstream um, adverse health effects. Great, so thanks so much. We have a few folks that are asking us about how best to receive the presentation um, later on. The slides are available via the materials um, that you can download here via the platform. They'll also be sent to you after the webinar. So those will be available to you in the follow-up email as a recording and as a PDF. Um, and Okay, another one here. How can we identify and obtain contact information for the women uh, VA liaison at our local VA? Uh, <clears throat> the, probably the easiest way is to um, email um, Jennifer Strauss. Jennifer Strauss is the project coordinator nationally for VA women's mental health issues, and she keeps a 
um, database of all the women champions at um, all of the VAs in the country. And when they change, uh, she keeps that up to date. Uh, and her email is fairly easy. It's Jennifer. Dot Strauss, that's S T R A U S S, at VA.gov. Okay, thanks so much. Another one here. Um, Several of you have um, sent us recommendations regarding um, other materials that um, in the media that might be worth um, exploring for others. Someone has recommended Ashley's War, um, and it looks like someone also asked if there were um, other new ones that have come out sort of in our post-9-11 um, world uh, besides I Love My Rifle More Than You by Kayla Williams. And um, so we wanted to thank you for those. And wasn't sure if anyone, um, uh, Megan, if you had any thoughts about those recommendations. So no, I don't. Those are both excellent recommendations and excellent books. I just wanted to make sure that I referenced the slide where I put up all of kind of the uh, the culture milieu, the pop culture. Those are all kind of the top, the best sellers, and those that won the most awards. So obviously there is. Uh, some literature out there, there are some movies and documentaries that are capturing the woman's experience. The Invisible War is a documentary that addresses the challenges with military sexual trauma. Then the military and is fantastic. Um, but I want to make sure I, those they do exist out there. But unfortunately, they, they tend to get buried beneath kind of the onslaught or the, the, the robust offerings that capture the male veteran or the male military experience. Um, but I love my rifle more than you. It's a fantastic resource, as is Ashley's War. Um, and then, again, I'll recommend the Invisible War as well that, that highlights military sexual trauma. Thanks, Megan. We have another question that's come in here asking about resources that are available in the VA to assist women veterans and or spouses with perinatal mental health issues or postpartum depression and anxiety. Um, wasn't sure if someone had uh, any resources we could direct anyone to there. Uh, yes, there are quite a number of resources related to that. One is that there is a national reproductive mental health consultation service. So any uh, VA clinician, uh, if they have a question about how to help a woman who is planning a pregnancy, pregnant, postpartum, or uh, has premenstrual problems or perimenopausal problems, anything related to reproductive cycle concerns, um, they can consult this um, national um, team that consists of reproductive mental health experts. Um, there are also lots of training materials that are periodically offered and become enduring trainings that the clinicians can access at any point. There are preconception planning materials for uh, women veterans as well. Uh, there are clinical pharmacists who create um, very detailed studies of new medications that come out. For example, brexanolone is a new uh, FDA-approved medication for um, postpartum depression that is just about to come out, probably next month or the month after. And there's already, you know, the you know, national clinical pharmacists at VA are really hard at work kind of creating a monograph, and we've already distributed a fax sheet to um, clinicians throughout the country about that. This also, by the way, apropos of Megan's comment about child care and about perinatal issues, there's a program called Tiny Boots, which is uh, free vetted child care uh, for uh, folks who are coming in for their medical appointments at VA. Thanks so much. Um, so the next one I have here is, what is the best way to promote engagement of female veterans in a mixed group with males in a mental health first aid class uh, or military um, module? Did you want each of us to address that or? Um, I'm, well, I'm why don't you go ahead and start? That. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, indeed, there, there are uh, classes in mental health first aid that are offered at VA, but also offered outside in the, uh, uh, VAs in a number of community settings. Um, there are 
some occasions where those are um, mixed gender groups where a woman might be reluctant to uh, attend a group of, of any type that's mixed gender but might really benefit from attending. So um, a number of things that can happen that might help that are uh, making sure that the groups are conducted in a trauma-informed way, um, making sure that um, a woman is, for example, if she has PTSD and needs this, uh, able to see the room ahead of time, able to feel comfortable that she's near an exit if she needs to be, able to meet the presenters ahead of time and address any specific things that will reduce her anxiety and allow her to re remain in the room comfortably. Um, and, and very often taking measures like that and being proactive and asking the woman what will help her reduce her anxiety and maintain uh, her presence in the room um, can can be really helpful. And those mental health first aid classes are really awesome. By the way, most of the sister -to sister volunteers uh, have taken those mental health first aid classes, and uh, that's part of their training to be a sister -to sister volunteer. Thank you. And we actually have a related question there asking if the Sister or Sister program is nationwide or is it still local? Um, it is available potentially nationwide in the sense that there is a toolkit for any VA that would like to begin a Sister or Sister program. But at this point, not every VA in the country has mounted a Sister or Sister program. It's, it's something that's been relatively recently rolled out. But if any VA would like to create a Sister or Sister program, the um, head, the, the National Volunteer Office of VA has this toolkit available to help them um, know how and to get started. Great. Let's see the next one here. Uh, another question we had here was how someone could get materials to become a certified independent telehealth service provider. We might not have information readily. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Michael, this is Cicely. I would say um, we do have some great resources that uh, SAMHSA and HRSA, the Health Resource Services Administration, have put together with our telehealth site. Um, I would uh, recommend folks check out the hrsa.gov. Um, within the VA, of course, that's a different system since it's one unified medical system, and um, they do have an office of telehealth that also can kind of be found on their va.gov website. But for community-based providers that are interested in that, I don't think you can go better than the HRSA website to find out about resources within states, how those uh, are reimbursed, and some of the um, actual uh, components for actually standing up a program. Great. Thanks, Celine. So another question we had here was how would we make it known to older veterans that they may qualify for assistance? I feel like that would be a great question to ask the entire group of participants um, because I, I guess the key is to, to think together about where are the places that um, older women might congregate and including older women veterans. Um, a lot of people have had success in going to uh, community fairs, to churches uh, and other places of worship. Um, in um, going through the veteran service organizations, but but not exclusively limiting to veteran services organizations and veteran stand downs, um, but to go beyond that to various other um, community venues uh, for women who may not self identify as veterans yet, but who might recognize the benefits of doing so if they start hearing about what um, they could access by doing so. Great. Um, we've got another one that came in here asking how an agency could become a collaborator with the VA for offering mental health services.
So this is Cicely. I'll jump in again on that one. Um, it's important, I think, to, uh, as an organization, uh, take a look at uh, who are your VA leadership within your communities. Um, the VA is set up into VISNs, Veterans Integrated Service Networks. Oftentimes, their community care or their outward-facing um, activities are set up very much uh, through um, more formalized agreements. And so reaching out to, in particular, your VISN mental health lead which again, you can um, just do a quick Google search for uh, the VA's uh, VISN mental health leads. Those folks would be a great place to start. The other thing is that VAs across the country offer community mental health summits where they're uh, inviting mental health providers within their communities to come and join and sit, sit in and have conversations around the needs of veterans in those, in those areas. <clears throat> and that's another great way to get introduced to your VA leadership in the mental health realm. Um, and then finally, I would uh, just recommend again, and then I'll, I'll hand it back to the uh, speakers as well, um, that we, uh, you know, throughout uh, our communities also have a great stand up of uh, teams that the Service Members, Veterans, and their Families Technical Assistance Center uh, has resources for where we could potentially introduce you to some of those individuals, but also um, through your community veteran engagement boards. So the VA's um, office there has those networks all across the country as well. So looking up your community veteran engagement board and engaging with some of the folks there is another great way to kind of meet that community and then introduce yourself as a resource. Great, thank you for that. And I think we are just coming up here on the end of our time, so I'll pass it back to Angela for some concluding thoughts. Yes, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, again, this is Angela Wright. As the Assistant Director of SAMHSA's SMVF TA Center, I uh, want to thank our presenters uh, so much for such great information. I, I really appreciate all the time that you put into these presentations. And I think that this is going to be a, a very helpful conversation that the audience can take forward into their own work. I want to invite the audience too to be to contact SAMHSA's SMVFTA Center if you have any questions, if you have any uh, technical assistance needs. Our information is up there on the screen, and uh, we invite you to do that. And uh, again, I'll pass it back to you. But thank you everyone for joining us today, and. Um, it's been a wonderful, uh, a wonderful webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. As a reminder, once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey of the presentation. We'd appreciate it if you would fill that out. You'll also receive a follow-up email by the end of the week with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. And on behalf of the National Council, Policy Research Associates, and SAMHSA's SMVFTA Center, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and please enjoy the rest of your day.